is a very important um, time in Paul's life. You know, I'm not saying anything else is not important, but here he has the opportunity to defend his faith in front of some of the most intelligent men that existed in his time period. So last week we talked about how Paul went to two different cities, to Thessalonica, and he preached to share the gospel, and the Jews ran him off. And then he went to Berea, and the Jews there listened, but then the Thessalonians got angry because they found out he was over there, and so they went and ran him off too. So now he is in Athens. He is in the ancient city of Athens, to where this is seen as the cultural and kind of religious headquarters of the world. And so he's walking around and says he's troubled in the spirit. He walks around and looks and sees all these different gods and idols and different kind of things. And that's where we are tonight. So Paul has the opportunity to talk to some of the most intelligent men that existed in his age. So we're looking at verses 22 through 34. We're talking about Paul in the Areopagus. And what this is going to be is Paul goes through these verses and basically just lays out for all of them from creation until judgment, who God is and what that means for not just those people listening, but for everyone. And so he starts, let's look at verse 22 and 23. He said, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So Paul's like, look, you guys have this whole religious thing down pat. You worship every single thing, every single God that you can think of, even ones that you don't know about. So tonight I'm going to show you, or today I guess, I'm going to show you this unknown God that you're worshiping. I'm going to tell you who he really is. And so these men in the Areopagus, and just Greece in general, were polytheists. Do you guys know what that means? It means they worship multiple gods. And so they have all these different gods that they worship, like Zeus and Hercules and all these other kind of things, because... They're either confused or they just think that there's a separate God for every single thing that happens, which they did. And so they're philosophers, and their main joy in life was just sitting around and talking about the purpose of life, asking the question, why do we exist? And so they were just sitting around all day long, had nothing better to do, by the way, and they were just sitting there and they would discuss this, like diving into the heart and the soul of why humanity is here. And so Paul has the opportunity to kind of wiggle on in there and tell them the truth. Um, so we talk about the religion of the crowd. Yes. In these two verses, Paul makes a statement that he can see that these men are very religious. They believe in all these different gods, and they worship all of them. The term, the term religious here, the way that Paul uses it, basically means that they're afraid of gods. And so what they're doing is they're hedging their bets. They're saying, we're going to find every single thing that we can worship, every single god that we can find, we're going to worship because one of those has to be right. And so instead of kind of making a decision, we're going to worship this one God, they worship all of them, hoping that they can figure it out before they die. Hoping that whatever God it is they're sacrificing to will be the one that they can, that will save them from nothingness in eternity. But their idea of religious worship was not the same as Paul's. And so they believed that there were gods or supernatural powers that intervened in the normal everyday life. So if there's a storm, that's a God who's angry. If there's a sunset, that's a God who's pretty. Or love is Aphrodite or these different things. And all these, these supernatural beings dictate emotion and dictate actions. I mean, he had Aries who was the God of war. So every time a little war is because Aries was impacting this and causing this to happen. And so they had a God for every single thing in life. And what they would do is they would deify human attributes. Now, to deify means to make it like God or to make it to God. So they would say, well, I get angry, so there's going to be a God of anger. I get upset there's a God of sorrow or a God of mischief or a God of happiness or love or joy or drunkenness and all these other things that Romans and Greeks believe because they were crazy. And so they would have all these different things. They will raise it up to the level of God saying that if I'm a little mad, God's going to be big mad. If I'm a little happy, God's going to be very happy. He's going to be the epitome of these things that we know. And not only would they have emotions in those things, but they would also have objects. And so they would create these idols, and they would worship these idols thinking that it would be something that they could worship as well. And so they would give life to that idol. And they, the thing that Paul acknowledges here is at least they were somewhat religious. And Paul's like, look, I see that you guys are religious. I see you have all these idols and all these gods and all these superstitions that you believe. And, you know, that's better than not believing in anything. But there's something better. But let's talk about, let's talk about um, religion for just a second. Everyone on earth worships someone or something. Think about it. Christians, we worship God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Muslims worship Allah. 
Buddhists worship Nirvana, and they have all these different things that they do. Um, Jews worship God, but they don't worship Christ. Even atheists worship something. They worship themselves. And so God created us to worship. It's just what happens is our worship gets converted and changed to things that are not God. And so just because you're religious does not necessarily mean that you're Christian. And so we need to separate those two things. When someone says, hey, I'm a religious person, that does not mean that they're a Christian. That just, believe, that just means that they believe that there's something bigger than themselves. That there is some kind of deity or some kind of supernatural force. Some people like to call it the universe. That is doing things that's out of their control. Or if they're an atheist, they think that they're more important. Or that they're bigger. Or that they're... they're very small knowledge is more important than the vast knowledge that God has. And so they're the center of their universe. And so everyone worships something. Now, each religion has certain beliefs or traditions or rituals that make them separate from others. So Christians, we do baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe you must repent to know Christ and for salvation. Muslims believe you have to work your way to heaven. Jews believe you have to work your way to heaven. Atheists believe there is no heaven. And so all these different religions have their traditions. They have their beliefs. Most of them have texts that they read and they teach out of. Some of us are superstitious. And that can become an idol as well. You ever do this? Knock on wood? How many of you walk through a, or walk under a ladder? Anybody ever broken a mirror? Did you get seven years of bad luck? If a black cat crosses your path, do you freak out? What other ones are there? I'm trying to think. Open an umbrella inside. Oh. Do you open an umbrella in the house? Yes. You can't do that. You can't. That's, that's bad luck. That's bad luck. You ran for South Carolina. That's bad luck. Exactly. I'll talk about that in a minute. But even things like superstition. You know, these things that we're raised with, like all these random things, old wives tales, and all these things that we believe are taught. That's still an idol. That's not Christianity. That's religion. One of the greatest, or actually one of the worst things that people like to say now is what karma is going to give them. That's not Christian either. If you're a Christian, you cannot believe in karma because that is not how God works. Karma means that people get what they deserve. The reason we have salvation is because God did not give us what we deserve. He took it himself. So karma does not exist. If you tell people karma, that's not Christianity. That is some false idea that does not correlate with Christ. But... Those things can become idols. And just like the Greeks, a lot of us are in that same boat. We have idols. They're not always these images or these graven things or these statues that we have, but they can become relationships. How many of you have been in a relationship with a guy or a girl and your faith stopped as soon as that relationship started? Um, <laughs> and so you no longer worship God, you worship that boy or that girl that you're dating. How many of you play a sport? And instead of coming to church, you start going to the games and you sacrifice everything for that game but you don't have time to read your Bible. It becomes an idol. It becomes what you worship. Family can become an idol. Entertainment is definitely one of the largest and most detrimental idols that we have to this day. We can sit here and scroll on TikTok and on Instagram for hours and hours and hours and look at some of the most idiotic videos in the existence of humanity. But we can't spend five minutes reading the Bible. We can't spend five minutes praying. We can't talk to this God that we worship and say that he saved our soul because we're too busy doing stuff that does not matter. It is an idol. Social media is an idol. Video games can be an idol. TV, entertainment, Netflix, all these things can be idols because it is taking away our attention from God. For some people, church is an idol. And let me explain that. If the only reason you come to church is to be seen and to judge other people, you're not here for the right reason. You're not here to worship. You can be at the church every day for the rest of your life, but if you're not here to worship Christ, it is an idol because it's about being seen. It's not about being in the presence of God. And so even church, something that's phenomenal, something that helps you grow in your faith, something that helps us have community and fellowship and all these great things can become an idol when we're doing it for the wrong reason. Family is great, but if you're doing family for the wrong reason, it's an idol. A relationship can be great. I mean, God created us for relationships. But if that relationship trumps our relationship with Christ, it's an idol. And it's going to hinder your faith and it's going to cause you to drift away from God and do things that you never thought you would do. You've got to protect yourself. Get rid of the idols in your life. Put God on the pedestal that he deserves to be on. 
and take that idol off of If anything waver causes you to waver in your relationship with Christ, it is detrimental and it's an idol. That's when you go from being Christian to being religious. That's when you go from being someone who is faithful to someone who can abandon them so easily because they have something right in front of their eyes. Paul's claim is that one of that it's one of encouragement in the sense that having some belief is better than none. But it doesn't stop there. You know, we don't go up with somebody if we're sharing the gospel. Like, hey, how are you doing? My name is Mark, and do you mind if I tell you about Jesus? Oh, I'm religious. Okay, good. Have a nice day. We don't do that because religion does not equal Christ. It doesn't equal a relationship. And so Paul tells them, look, it's great that you have religion. You've got the foundation that you need to understand that there is a God of the universe. But let's get more specific. Let's talk about why we believe what we believe. Let's talk about Jesus. And so he gets them away from this polytheistic idea that they can worship whatever they want to and hedge their bets and think that one of them is going to allow them to have some kind of eternity. And he shows them John 14, 6. And this is what it says. It says, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except through me. Even though Paul praised them for being religious, he used this as a segue or an opportunity to transition into sharing the gospel. And so the strange teaching that he was brought into the Areopagus to tell them is him sharing Jesus with them because they've never heard it before. There's some things I've heard in my life that I thought were really peculiar or strange because I never heard it before. There are things that you guys have heard. You're like, there's no way that's true. And then you Google it. Oh, yeah, I guess it is true. This is the same mentality that these men had when they were listening to what Paul was trying to say. They had never heard it before. They didn't have Christians in their community they were listening to. They didn't know the traditions of the Jews or anything else. And all they had was their, their Greek gods. And so when they hear something different, it's peculiar, it's strange. And so they're interested, they're intrigued by it. And so he uses it as a segue to talk about Jesus. And so it's like the apology of Paul. Now this is not mean he's sorry for what he's saying, but throw up the next word there. Apologia. It means a defense, especially with opinions, position, or actions. If you're not familiar with the term, we have this phrase or this term that we use in Christianity called apologetics. And what that means is a defense of the faith, being able to defend what you believe. And that's what Paul has the opportunity to do today. He stands in front of these men defending his faith. Now, he's not on trial or anything. He's not going to go to prison if this goes south. They're genuinely interested in what he has to say. But he is defending everything that he believes. Defending Jesus. Which is why we did a little exercise to try to get someone to convince you of something else. But he has the opportunity to do this. And so what he says is the very God that you're worshiping in ignorance is the one who I proclaim to you today. So he spends these next eight verses talking about all these characteristics of God, why God is the only true God, and how Christ ties into all of this. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to break all of these down, hopefully in the next 12 minutes. But this is kind of like a 20,000 foot view of what we're going to get into later on when we get into apologetics. When we're talking about the nature and the character of God. So let's go ahead and look at the first one. Verse 24, this is what it says. It says, The God who made the world and all the things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So God created all things. He's the Lord of everything. This talks about His power. We use the word omnipotent, which means that God is all powerful. We see the evidence of this in Genesis 1.1. Where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 33, 6, where it says that the Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. I talk a lot. And I've never been able to manifest something out of my speech except for bad breath. And yet God brought all the creation in just by speaking. There's no one or no thing that is any more powerful than God. There's nothing even on God's level close to him. It talks about God's sovereignty. Which means that he's in control of everything. Psalm 115.3 says that God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Nobody tells God what to do. Because God's over all of it. He is Lord of everything. That means he's in control. He calls the shots. When things seem like they're out of control in your life, God is still in control. Next, God's a saving. God does not exist in man-made things. Now, this is a fancy word, which means an uncreated creator. And this is something that a um, theologian named Thomas Aquinas argued many centuries ago, and I can see the information if you really want to get into it. But what he says is that God's existence is, existence is not dependent on anyone or anything else. Each one of us in this room has parents. Or at some point had parents. They had parents. And so on and so forth until Adam and Eve. God was not created. God does not have parents. 
God exists outside of time and space. Which means that our existence is dependent upon Him, but His existence is not dependent upon us. This is exactly what God gets into in Exodus 3.14 when He tells Moses, I am that I am. That means I existed before time was created. I will exist now and I will exist forevermore. I am who I am. There has never been nor will ever be a time in which God did not or will not exist. Next it says that He's not served by human hands because God doesn't need anything. So God is transcendent. Now this means that God exists outside of the physical, material existence. He's not limited to the material realm. This means that everything that is around us does not dictate who God is. He's not limited to the same things that we're limited to. God is omnipresent. We'll get to that in a second, but it means that God exists everywhere. So this means that as, as creatures, as created, there's nothing that we can give God that will sustain Him. There's nothing that we would give God that will feed Him or quench his thirst or anything else because God has everything that he needs in himself. He is self-sufficient. So there's nothing. We can't work our way to heaven. We can't earn our salvation by doing things that makes God proud of us because our salvation is given to us freely because there's nothing we can give God that is going to make him like us any more or any less. And what this also means is that we should approach him with a sense of reverence or awe. When we pray, we shouldn't be goofing off and cracking jokes and trying to mess with our friends. Because we're talking to the creator, the all-powerful of the universe. He's righteous. That means he's perfect. He's other. He's separate from us in that. The next verse, verse 25, it says, Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gave to all the people life and breath and all things. So this verse is talking about the fact that God is a provider of everything. In Genesis 2, 7, it says, And the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living being. The breath that you're breathing right now is a gift of God. Every time your heart beats, it's a gift from God. Every time you wake up in the morning, lay your head at night, and all these things that you do, it is a gift from God. Have God ever thought about the fact that in all these universe, or all these planets and galaxies and everything that they found all over space, there's only one planet that has life? It's because God created it with a purpose. We're here because God wanted us to be here. The breath in our lungs, the life that we have, the things that we get to do are all gifts from God. And so we should not take advantage of that. And then Matthew 6, 31 and 32, talking about God being provider, it says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to dress like or what you're going to do because God knows what you need. And God's going to give it to you. They're talking about how the flowers were dressed so exquisitely and yet Solomon was dressed better than they were. God provides what we need. So we don't have to worry about that. Next in verse 26. It says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God made all mankind from Adam. Now what this is saying is there is no racial or national superiority. The color of your skin does not dictate the value of your life. Where you were born does not dictate how valuable you are. Because if you want to be honest, every one of us have the exact same two descendants. Which means that all of us at some point are related. So you're no better than someone else just because you look differently or you talk differently or you have a different job or anything else. And God made that very apparent in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 15 and 21 where he talks about how all of us were created in God's image, how all of us were made from Adam. And then he even kind of knocks us down another rung in Romans 5, 12, where he talks about from sin came from one man being Adam. Adam is our all of our fathers. And so therefore, because Adam sinned, we are sinners as well. And so not a single person that has been a descendant of Adam has been perfect. Which is why Jesus was not born of Adam. None of us are perfect, which means we're all guilty, which means that none of us are any better than anyone else just because of this. We're all equal in God's eyes. Paul was talking about this for the Greeks because they felt they were more superior than anyone else and felt like anyone that wasn't a Greek was a barbarian. But I really wish that Christians would have read this about 50 or 60 years ago and really thought about this 100 years ago and understood that just because someone is a different race, it does not mean that they're less than you. That's something we can do now as a church. We can reach out to people just because they don't look like us does not mean that Jesus did not die for them too. We're all created in God's image. Next, he determined their appointed times. So verse 27 again. This talks about God being omniscient, having total knowledge, knowing everything. There is nothing that God does not know. 
which means he knows your past, he knows your present, he knows your future. He knows what's going to happen with your grandkids, with your great-grandkids. He knows what happened with your great-grandparents. 1 John 3.20 says, If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. And He knows everything. Because God knows everything, you are where you need to be right now in existence. I used to always tell people, you know, I wish I was born in the 50s. Because things were a lot simpler then. But here's the thing. If I was born in the 50s, I would not have the opportunity to talk to you right now about Jesus. If you were born any different year of your life, you would not be sitting in this room. You may not be a part of the same family, haven't gone through the same things to bring you to the point to where you get to hear the gospel and understand who God is. God does not do anything by accident. Everything has a purpose. And so you're sitting in this room right now because God preordained you to be here before creation even existed. Because he wanted you to hear what I'm saying. You're in your family because God ordained it. Now this does not mean that your life is going to be perfect. Some people have very, very difficult lives. And from the outside, it looks like there's no meaning to it. But we don't get to see the world how God sees it. And so something tragic may happen to one person, but it could cause thousands of other people to repent. It could cause something horrible to stop because somebody finally decides to stand up and do something about it. Psalm 139.13, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. This talks about intentionality. It talks about purpose. No one is an accident. Nothing is done by accident. God has you here for a reason. God has you here for a purpose. He has a plan for you to exist when you are and where you are. There are millions of people that will not be born in the United States. There are thousands or millions of people that may not hear the gospel. We ask the question, why? When Jesus gave the great commission, he told us to go and make disciples of all nations. The reason people don't hear the gospel is because we're not getting up and telling them. It's not because God is unfair. It's because Christians are lazy. We are here to share the gospel. We are here to worship Christ and to make him known and to tell people about Jesus. So we exist for a purpose, for a reason. We're here because this is when, when God ordained for us to exist. Our job is to seek out God's will for our lives and do what he's calling us to do. Next, it says, in him we live and we move and we exist. Verse 28 for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his children. This means God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. In every time. There's not a time God does not exist. There's not a place that God does not exist. This is not saying that God is everything. Or that God is in everything. Because I am not God. You are not God. This podium is not God. There are some people who believe that God is in items. That is not the case. But God is around us. God exists everywhere because He's not in our present. Psalm 139, 7 through 12. The writer of the psalm is saying there is nowhere in creation that He can go where God is not there, whether it's the highest of the heavens or the pits of hell. Whether it's in darkness or in light, whether there's hiding or in the open, God is always there. That means that if you're running away from God, He's there anyway. He's watching you do it. If you're drawing close to God, He's there waiting for you. We cannot outrun God. I don't care how fast you are. You can't do it. Because God is everywhere. This talks about His eminence. God is present and sustaining the universe. Now, eminence is a closeness. As in, it's right, it's about to happen. Typically, it's a negative thing. But when God is talking about how intimate He is with His children, with His followers. Colossians 1.17, it says, he, he is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. If God did not exist, nothing would be here. And if God stopped existing, the fabric of the universe would be ripped to shreds. Because God himself is holding everything and sustaining everything together. God is close to his children. Proverbs 18, 24 says, There is a friend who remains closer than a brother. And at this time, your brother was supposed to be the closest person to you. And saying that God is closer than that. God knows everything about you. God is not an idol. He's not created or imagined by human hands. So 29 says, being in the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. God is not something or someone that we've imagined. He is not something that we just thought up one day and started trying to make people believe it. It's not the opiate for the masses. God is real. He has existed before anything was created. He created all of it. When we try to reimagine God to fit our purposes, we are worshiping an idol and not God. 
When you've got entire groups of people saying, that, well, we don't believe that God does this, and then you open the Bible and it shows it clearly that God does it, they don't worship God. They worship something of their imagination. When people try to put Jesus into this box and say that he does a certain thing, but then Scripture tells us that's not what it's supposed to be. When they're trying to say that Jesus promotes sin or Jesus promotes something that's wrong, that's not Jesus because Jesus upheld the law. Jesus was perfect. And so anytime somebody tries to tell you that Jesus would do this and Jesus would do that, if they don't have Scripture to back that up, they're not worshiping Jesus. They're worshiping an idol of their own creation. And we don't do that. There are days to where I want to say things and God's like, shut up. To where I want to do things and God's like, nope, that's not what I would do. If your God always agrees with everything that you do, then you are your own God. If God does not convict you and show you when you're wrong and try to make you do what you're supposed to do, bring you to righteousness to look like Him, you're not worshiping God. Because God does not bow down to us. We are supposed to bow down to Him. But He's close to us. He wants to know us. And He wants you to know Him. So we can't reimagine Him into our preferences. God tells us who He is in His Word. We see a lot of this tonight. We've gone through a lot of these different topics. He does not indwell in idols and told us not to make idols of Him. In Exodus 20, verse 4, it says, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters. Because there's nothing in existence that looks like God. There's nothing in existence that can even come close to comparing to who God is. And so we can't create or imagine anything that would even be close to God. There was a guy named Anselm of Canterbury. And he said, God is that then which nothing can be compared. Saying that God is greater than anything that we could possibly imagine. That we can think of the most perfect thing and imagine it, and God is greater than that. And so it's impossible for us to fathom who God is in His greatness and His just who He is. Acts 7, 47 and 48 talks about however the most high God does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. So God forbids idolatry consistently in Scripture. And Paul even says in 1 Corinthians that we are the temple that God dwells in. He does not dwell in buildings or in objects that are man-made, but He dwells within us if we are believers. So we have become the temple. Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 20. So if you haven't seen God face to face, don't try to make an image of Him. Nothing in creation is like Him. Psalm 115, it says that those that create idols will become like Him. So you build up this, this Jesus or this God that you want to believe in, and it's contrary to what Scripture says. The more you lie to yourself and believe that, the more you're going to be like that. And what God says is when you form these idols, you're going to be just as hollow and just as dead as they are. Because that's not God. And so whether we have a trinket sitting on our steering wheel or we have this shrine in our bedroom or we have this entire church established to this false God, God's not there. And we're going to perish just like those things. Next it says God overlooked the time of ignorance. That's verse 30. Therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. What this is talking about is the fact that God showed His mercy all throughout Scripture. All throughout the Old Testament, there's a cycle of God blessing His people. They get, they get complacent. They start worshiping false God. God sends a prophet and says, hey, it's time to repent. He gives them the choice to either repent and turn away from their sin or to keep living in that sin, but destruction's coming. And so He always sends judgment. If they repent, then God saves them. Look at in the book of Jonah where it talks about Nehemiah. This entire pagan nation... God sends Jonah to tell them, hey, you need to repent. They actually do, and God saves them. But when you look at Israel, God tells them time and time again, you need to repent, and yet they kill the prophet. They've gone so far away from God and created an idol that they think that they have this, this idea of who God is, and no one can, can take that away from them. And yet they're killing the messengers of God. They killed all these prophets. They killed Jesus because they created a God in their own image. And so eventually this mercy runs out. But God showed His mercy. 2 Peter 3, 9 is one of the most beautiful verses. It says, The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. It's not that God's being lazy or God's just waiting around, but He's being patient for your sake. The reason why humanity still exists is because God is calling you to repentance, to surrender. He does not want anyone to perish, but wants everyone to repent. God does not want anyone to go to hell. Go ahead and get that thought out of your imagination. God did not create anyone purposely to go to hell. But what He does because He loves us so much is He gives you the choice. Are you going to surrender to me or are you going to live for the world? And you get to choose what you're going to do. And there are consequences to everyone. If you choose to surrender and to follow Christ, you get to spend eternity with Him. You get to have this relationship with Him. If you reject Him, you spend eternity in hell. 
It's your choice. But he wants everyone to repent. God wants to be in a relationship with us, with, with our Creator, with our Savior. Even in times that you feel like you may be too far gone, there's some people that say, I just I can't be saved. I've done too much. God can still save me. If God can take Saul and turn him into Paul, the man that was murdering Christians and murderous threats against the church, and turn him into one of the most prolific Christians in the New Testament, God can save you too. God restored Peter. Peter messed up. He betrayed Christ and turned his back on him whenever he was supposed to stand up. And yet Jesus restored him back and gave him an opportunity to be one of the biggest Christians in the early church. And actually was the first person to proclaim through a sermon to thousands of people about the resurrection of Christ and thousands were saved. If you're a believer and you're struggling in your faith, you're not too far gone. God can restore you as well. Paul tells us in the next verse how to do this. So the ninth thing, he declares repentance. Paul tells the Areopagus that there is a day in which all people are going to be judged. Every one of us in this room, at some point, you're going to have to stand before God and you're going to have to answer for everything that you did. But the most important question you're going to be asked is, what did you do with Jesus? Each one of these men that heard this apologetic or heard this apology of Paul had to stand before God and have an account for what they did with Jesus. Because it's not about the idols that we create. It's not about the relationships or the people that we worship. It's about Christ. Have we surrendered and trusted Christ as our Savior or are we still chasing after the world? One of the, the coolest stories in scriptures where Jesus is talking to people about the shepherd and says that the sheep know his voice and how when he calls out, they come. Which also means that the shepherd knows the sheep. So does Jesus know you? Because if you're not one of the sheep, you're not going to be spared from God's wrath. Paul writes in Romans 3, 25 and 26. I'm not sure if you can see this or not. But it says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. Talking about God's foreknowledge. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. That's it. God is sparing your life so that you can come to a relationship with Christ. That's why we still exist. Jesus tells us throughout the Gospels there's going to be separation and judgment. Those who believe and those that don't. Those who believe are children of God and will be with Him for eternity. Those who do not are children of the devil and are going to be cast into hell. The crowd had an opportunity to respond in verses 32 to 34. It says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, What shall we shall hear you again concerning this? So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, or Demaris, and others with him. So the response to the crowd, there's three responses that each person there and each person here and each person that will ever exist has to make. First of all, they said no. They laughed at him. They made fun of him. They sneered at him. They said it was a joke. He was an idiot. They didn't believe him. Some of you in this room may be in that group. The second, they wanted to hear more. So they said not yet. Some of you in the room are waiting until something happens to where you do all the sin that you want to do and one day you're going to wake up and say, hey, I, just, I want to be a Christian today. That's not how that works. We don't get to decide when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Whenever God tells you it's time to repent, it's time to repent. Because like I told you earlier, every breath that you have in your lungs is a gift from God, and at some point that breath's going to run out. And if you've not made that decision to trust Christ before then, you're going to stand before God. And you're going to be cast out. And then third, some repented and surrendered to Christ. So they said, yes. So there were some men and some women that were listening to his defense that Paul gave, and they said, absolutely, 100%, we are going to surrender to Christ. We believe that this is the truth, and we are going to follow him for the rest of our lives. So we all have this decision to make. I challenge each one of you to really think about where you are. Have you said, no, God, I don't want you? If you have, why? What brought you to that decision? If you're saying, God, not yet, what is holding you back? What is it in the world that you find to be more important than the relationship with your Savior and your Creator? And if you said, yes, God, I, I surrender, did you make that decision tonight? Is this something that you made years ago? Have you followed through a baptism church membership? Are you using the talents and the gifts that God has given you to glorify Him? 
Are you sharing the gospel with people? Are you sharing your testimony, preaching Christ through your life, through your actions, through your words? Let me pray.